Oh, thanks so much for the nice introductions. Um, I have to uh, blame Tangs for uh, two things. One is that uh, he placed me at the end of the day where everyone is tired. I asked for the afternoon session, not the last one, um, but I consider the lucky, lucky one, all right? Another one is that I, I, I blame his uh, employers for, um, for making me working on this topic because they, they saw it all. They've done all come to vision and NLPs. Then ask myself, what's left for me, right? So um, naturally, it's left for me is biology, right? So then here we go as a drug discovery. Um, it's funny thing because when I search um, the keyword drugs, it's just to find some supporting documents, uh, image, nice image. Uh, for my this, um, slide, and they're all about um, drug dealers. Um, and so this one is not about that, right? Don't, don't be too excited. Um, so my name is Chin Chant, and um, I got introduced. Uh, I'm from Lake University in Australia. For those who don't know where it is, it's uh, near Melbourne. Um, it's a city in, uh, Victoria, uh, in uh, Australia. So, um, so last, uh, a few months ago, there was a big uh, breaking news. Uh, I think it's, it's as big as BERT, right, in NLPs, or maybe comparable to uh, Alex uh, Net in computer vision. So it was um, the moment that, um, for the first time, my AI actually suggested a drug, and uh, it was made in the lab, and it was tested on the mice, and the result, the result was good. Right. So, and the total period of time for doing so before the testing was only 46 days. It's a record terms because normally it takes like years to do so. Right. So it's a it's the first moment that we really have something that created from AI that actually works on the mice, not human. Yes, don't be too excited. It takes many years to test on human. That how thing works. Right, so, um, so my talk today, if I have enough time, uh, I've been told that I don't have enough time. Um, so I will introduce a little bit about the field of drug discoveries um, and how to proceed from there, uh, from the um, AI point of view, because I'm not a biologist, I'm not a chemist, so I can't talk from that point of view. So from my point of view, uh, so those are the things that AI uh, people would do. Uh, first, you would learn remuneration, so like, like you learn remuneration in any fields, and you want to predict something, um, you want to um, and generate something. So that, that pretty much AI view of the world. So, um, for those who um, don't know, drug is a small molecule um, that binds to a bio biological target. Uh, could be most of the time the proteins, and could be something else, but protein is a common one. And that modifies the function of that bio uh, target so that it has the intended effect, right? So, in that definition, tea is, or coffee is a, is a drug because it, it modifies your mental effect, uh, the mental powers, and, and have an intended effect that uh, probably you know it. Um, and protein is a large biomolecule, so it, it diverse way, right? So one is a more small molecules, another the big molecules. Um, so the different main different thing is that this is a change of the animal acids, right? Um, the drug is a, normally the thought of at the grab, and protein is pretty much in, in the in the raw form it's a, a string, right? It, you can think of a string of text. And here it is. Um, so drug is small molecule. Protein is the big um, folding things, like uh, ribbon folding things. And when they work together, the drugs get like dock into the protein and have some effect on the protein itself. Um, so a drug discovery is a process of fighting a drug with the intended effect. So pretty much uh, it's about that. But it's very complex in the sense that you have to understand biology, chemistry, and almost everything else. Uh, to make the drug work, right? Um, so that's why it's expensive and it's very important. Um, and um, there's the concept of drug likeness. Um, so to be able to quantify as a drug, uh, the molecule have to have to, to satisfy certain properties. Um, that's not all, but at least some property have to be there. Like you can put it in water and it works, and it goes through the body and it goes to bloodstreams. Um, so it have to be small enough, it have to have certain properties as well. So biologists would know, would know uh, those properties well. And here's the traditional um, highlight of uh, discovering drugs. First, it takes about 10 years or more uh, to start from the concept to the final drugs that being approved on the market. And it costs about a billion dollars or more, right? Uh, and probably it costs a lot of mice in, in the process. Um, so, um, 
and it's, it's, it's very expensive because uh, you have scanned through the, like a million of molecules to get about a thousand of possible molecules and then have the, from the thousand, it probably isn't one of them would make possible drugs, right? Um, it's very, very expensive process. And then come to the, the AI-driven uh, process, uh, which is very, very new. Um, it's been there for a long time, but uh, only um, a speed up, I think, um, sped up like, I think about three years ago, right? Um, then it's quite different. Right? Here, here is a process that um, proposed by in silico is a, one of the leading um, AI pharmacy company uh, startup right now. Um, so um, they propose like um, using AI in throughout all the all the step of making the the the, uh, the drugs. And in our in our talk, we are focusing mostly on the middle part and how to um, identify and generate a, a possible molecule that has the intended effect. This is quite complex, but um, but interesting, very interesting. Right. So um, in um, in this field, we try to answer three basic questions. One is that if you have to give me molecules, and is that is that the drug, right? or, or is that some random molecules? Right? Um, so we have to answer all kind of other questions like does it look like a drug? Does it have the you know target to buy to? Does it work on the target? Um, what are the other properties of the drug? Like when you go to the body, what what does it affect? Like does it make you happy or or, or sad or how does it like, go with food, go with waters? Um, how does the board accept or reject it? A lot of properties that we have to answer before we can quantify some things that's, that worth considering. Right? Um, another question which is much more difficult, that given a target, which is a certain protein that we want to, uh, to modify, uh, what, is, uh, what is a molecule that can affect that target? Right? It's a very, very difficult question because um, research disease, they identify the disease, and from disease, they identify certain uh, bio-target, like certain protein to modify, but then no one knows how to do it, right? How, no one knows how to, to make a drug yet, so it takes many, many years to do so, right? So um, if the list of molecules is given, so we just rank them up and pick the best one, but most of the time it's not given, right? So we have to suggest a molecule which in the form of chemical formula with the hope that we can make in the lab. Right? It's no guarantee because it's not easy. So the question is that given a molecule, if you know one, then how can you make it? Right? So it's another question that AI also contribute to. Uh, how, uh, it, it, it's called um, synthetic structurabilities. And for those who are um, keen on AI reasoning and planning, it's pure matter, pure matter planning problems. Right? You start from the goal you want to achieve, and what are, you walk back, what are the steps that from the very basic molecules walk up into the, through the reaction chains up to the molecules that you want to, right? So it's not, uh, it isn't a planning problem, but it's a very interesting one. Right, so um, like anyone who work in analysis, they, you always start with representation, right? You don't start with raw data anymore, right? So, so given the molecules, you want to put the molecule in the form that computer can process it, right? So the first thing we do is, of course, put it in a vector, right? Embedding all kinds of tricks that you do. Um, chemists, um, they've been there for a long, long time. They actually have a very nice way to do so. They go fingerprints, right? So a fingerprint is a way that convert a, the graph into a vector, a discrete vector, basically. Um, that's because it's very easy to deal with vectors, right? We have all kinds of mathematical tools to deal with vectors. You can transform it, you can multiply, you can, you know, delete, you can, you know, um, add random noise to it. And here is one of the techniques that's more recent, actually, molecule, um, it's not a, a product from by, by chemistry, it's a product from machine learning. Um, it's applying the convolutional nets to the um, graph molecules, and then in process compute the vectors. But it was a very um, early days. Um, and then once the vector, you can do a lot of things, like for those doing uh, deep learning, you know that you can do um, autoencoders, you can do the GAN, you can do all, all sort of other things. And this one, in one example, using the adversarials, autoencoders, um, for um, generalizing um, the new fingerprints, right? They work directly on the fring fingerprint itself, not, not the graph. So that's one example. Um, then another way, um, more, even more popular way to do so is that you either give me the molecules, I try to represent it as a string so that a computer can read it. That's just like, just like normal sentence, right? So one of the most popular one is called Smile. Um, it's, it's a way to um, convert a graph into, um, into string, you see the, the molecule here, you can, um, and here the one way to, to put it into string. There are multiple ways, not, not one way. 
But this one, computer can read and understand it. There's certain grammar rules and to make that this, this kind of argumentation. Uh, you can go sentence if you like, because it has a certain grammar. Um, uh, because there's sequence, so as a deep learning person, you can think, well, okay, I can put in sequence to sequence more. We don't attend to other, other tricks. A transformer and many other tricks, right? Even memory network, even uh, reinforced modeling, um, that all tricks that you can think of because there's sequence, right? Um, but the problem with that, the string to graph is not unique, right? Uh, and the graph to string is not unique either. Right? So uh, I had the trouble. Um, and if it generates some strings, a lot of them are invalid. Right? It's no way you can convert back to a graph with some string, right? Because that, the space of string is kind of like very, very uh, uh, unrestricted, whereas the uh, space of graph is much more restricted. And the precise information, 3D information, is lost. And 3D information is very important to compute a lot of uh, dynamic property of molecules, right? Um, and uh, the other trouble is that um, um, if a graph you have a certain short ring between the two atoms, but then when you put in strings, uh, when you put in strings, a certain, um, certain atoms are, are quite distant in the string. Uh, whereas in the original model, it, it's, it, it's close, right? So the better way is, of course, it's using a graph by itself, right? You don't need to do anything, it's just, that's a represent the molecule as a graph as it is, right? Um, troubles, again, right? Um, because graph doesn't have a fixed size, right? It doesn't have fixed orders, right? It can permute and it's still the same graph. Um, and um, it don't have very good model of generating a graph because uh, it can have a good model, of autogressive model of generating a sequence, but it's not easy to model a distribution of a graph because of the all, pop, all trouble that we know, that in no regular structures, no, no fixed size, and no uh, easy way to fix the permutation invariant problems. Okay. And um, yeah, okay. Um, there are many, uh, uh, many, many uh, other requirements as well, but are we not talking about this uh, for now? Right, so um, here's one of the things that uh, we work on for the last uh, two years. Um, it, um, it was inspired by the uh, memory networks, a classical one, like about four years ago, five years ago. Um, but uh, we tried to make it uh, to work on the graph structure data, and quite generic, uh, so it could possess a graph in the, uh, uh, a a nice way. So here's one example, that, uh, sorry, not example, is here's how it looks when you, when you run it, unroll it and, and run it uh, with your, um, you know, deep learning frameworks and it become, become a computational, computational graph. Um, so it receives um, uh, the, the drug, uh, graph, graph as input um, and has the controller to control the message passing between the molecules, so mo an atom to mimic the interaction, the bonding, chemical bonding between the atoms. And in the, in, at the end of the day, it collects the output, and that is uh, either prediction or something else, or generation or something else. But quite, quite, quite neat frameworks and to do many things. All right, um, so that the molecules, which is the drug itself. Uh, but then the, another question is that big, big question is how to represent a, a protein itself. Um, so for those who are um, not in the biology, uh, protein is a string of um, aluminum acid and represented at as a, like 20 different characters. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we have only 20, 20, 20 animal acids in the, in the protein, and it has a string of characters. Uh, the vocab is about 20. Um, and the length could, be, could vary from, I think, a few hundred to a few thousands. Um, but then the problem with the 1D representation is that it doesn't, have the, it doesn't look like a real protein. The protein has the 3D structures, right? But the problem with 3D structures is very hard to know. No one have very good model yet of how to f convert one D string into 3D. So the latest um, and, and winning method so far has been uh, default uh, from DeepMai, uh, but then it's still quite inaccurate compared to um, what we really want to have. And, and the practice that we have and very few proteins these days available, um, those are being characterized by empirical methods. Uh, in, in 3D structure, but we, do, we know that we want this structure very well. Um, but then the good thing about what this structure is that um, you can actually you, you employ a lot of NLP uh, techniques like embeddings, um, doc to vec, uh, doc to vec, uh, close sequence to vec, or other MO, the birds, or other, other advances you can think of um, borrowing from the NLP field. So actually, it's very, very popular um, research this day how to use NLP technique to represent the protein in a structured way that is useful uh, for the future work. 
So I'm moving on to the next, um, next part. Um, so the question is that uh, if I have a protein and then I have a, a molecules, then what are they doing together, right? So I expect that they, they interact, right, in, in certain way. But who knows, right? It's not easy, right? Um, so that probably the, 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 the job could um, normally call the drug target binding or drug target affiliate, affiliate prediction or many other things. But from a machining point of view, we can translate the problem into question answering, right? So Tang Xie would be an expert in that. Um, so you can, you can tell easily, right? So, all right, you have the um, questions and you have the text. And by nature, they can put together, right? So here's one of the, uh, the model that actually one of colleagues, uh, colleagues of my uh, uh, cook up. Um, and it's quite simple. You, you use a graph convolutional net to process a graph, and you use a, um, CNN to, to process the string, put together, and predict. Right? So uh, quite simple, quite, quite intuitive. Um, but it works quite well. Right. So um, I put it here is that you can think of as a question answering. You have the context or text, or you have the queries or questions. I have the answer. Right? The answer here is pretty much the scoring, uh, the numerical scoring of how good or how strong the, the interaction is. Um, we also uh, make use of our, our own structure, our own models to uh, make things more flexible because we can put as many queries as you want, you can put as many graphs as you want, the model actually can be extended into multiple graphs. Um, and then you can train jointly, we can do many, many things. So, um, so the, the result was, was here, um, some result was here, and it, it showed to outperform all the um, known techniques so far in, um, in predicting whether the, a, a drugs interact with certain uh, targets. So that is called um, RDMN, is one of the techniques that we um, developed so far. So another way to think about is, um, um, oh, okay, drug is still, uh, biting is still a quick QA problems. So is a, here's another techniques um, under development. Um, so we think of uh, the protein as a, um, a big structure which have many parts interacting with each other and also at the same time interacting with the drugs. Um, so here's a technique that um, the model that we are, uh, are under development. Um, the results are quite uh, interesting, but we're not, not finalizing yet. So the idea is it's quite simple. Uh, we have a, a unit called randomized unit, uh, which stands from one array of objects to another array of objects, condition on something, right? Condition on question or queries or any other things, right? Um, and the protein being here that uh, considered as a hierarchy, hierarchy of the random power set, which is uh, the concept that we uh, cook up. Um, and do, by doing so, we're bypassing two things. One is that um, the, you have to estimate the protein structure, which is we don't, we don't know how to, so we just try to bypass the problem. Another one is that we don't know where the binding happened, because the drug is small and protein is big. So when put, the drug comes to protein, it's only by to one tiny bit of the protein. We don't know, right? So we have to make assumption that um, something may happen. Um, and we try to aggregate all the possible effects. All right, so uh, moving to the next part, um, giving, uh, having, having predicted uh, the uh, target, um, the binding effects, um, the next question is that um, how can you make use of the known drugs for the new purpose, right? We know that because it's very expensive to make a drug, right? It's a billion dollars business. Um, it takes many, many years, right? So what if you use a known drug uh, for something else? So that's called repurposing. And actually very, very popular this day. Uh, a lot of drugs being um, uh, deploy for some one thing being uh, having the nice effect to another, then um, so you can uh, you can make use of that for free, right? Um, so again, um, so again, uh, we uh, we uh, made use of the, the the techniques that we showed before. Uh, try to predict single drug effects on many uh, many things that um, that possibly. Uh, we can think of so that those uh, cancers in, uh, in the, the, the fungus um, uh, things. So we show that um, training jointly together um, uh, is uh, more accurate than training uh, one, one output at a time. Right? Um, so the so two things, one is that, that one drug can actually work in many things. Another one, the thing is that training jointly uh, can uh, give better results. It's quite a well-known. Uh, effects of multitask learning and, and similar things in machine learning. Uh, all right, another one is, uh, another model is with uh, Primix uh, early this year. It's called the GM, GML. It stands for the graph attention or, or something similar for the multi-label uh, learning. 
So we, uh, I'm not going to detail here the idea that uh, you can expand the number of possible output as many as possible at the very minimum cost. And, and I think it's quite similar. Um, we can have good result um, by predicting many output at the same time. Like let's say here, uh, five can, uh, nine cancer at the same time or, or binding to 50 can put in at the same time. Right? Um, you, you do at the same time, it's actually more accurate than doing one at a time. And that, that's a very nice result. All right, so another issue that um, in, in, in drug development, you have to be worried about the, the, um, the unintended effect of uh, interacting between drugs, right? So um, if, if the good doctors ask you what, um, before giving the drugs, they normally they ask, what are the drugs, what are the drugs that you are taking, right? Because they actually interact. Many of them interact in a really bad way, right? unintended way. Some are interacting in a good way, some are not, right? So we need to know in advance that what are drugs are, are interacting or can predict the property in advance. So um, in doing so, um, it creates another problem. Uh, which we, have, we have multiple graphs, which is graph one drugs, and you ask question, you know, what are the pair of interacting? Or if, if it's not the pair, then if it, it's with them like triple, right, interacting at the same time. And it's going to in interesting problems. And, and in doing so, uh, we actually, um, or well, it's not showing here for some reasons, um, but then uh, we extended the, the uh, RDMN uh, framework to, to, to incorporate multiple graphs, which is uh, having us to, uh, have, 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 having us to, to handle multiple uh, molecules at the same time. And uh, we apply it to predict the um, chemical chemical interactions. And um, the result is quite interesting because uh, the model is flexible to incorporate many other features as we know, uh, the contextual information and features we know, and other prior information we know about the the environment or the, the, um, the structure of the graph. And the result was, was very interesting um, from the standard data set we got a, um, compared to other techniques known uh, just, just this year before. Right, so I'm um, coming to the last point. Um, this is the most important part and most difficult one and there's a lot of activity going on right now and um, success or break of AI pretty much depends on this uh, because the prediction is easy but the generation is not. Um, so, one way to think as an AI person, you can think of drug design as a structure machine learning translations or, or conditional generation, if you like. The only thing is that the drug itself is not a sequence, right? It's a graph. So, the generic model of graph itself is very, very open and important to fix uh, in machine learning this day, right? Um, well, it poses a question of what kind of implementation you use, right? If it's string, then yes. Uh, it's very uh, ready, technology is quite ready. But if you graph, then it's not easy, right? Um, because we have the models in node interaction at the same times. Um, you have the model many, many other things at the same times. Uh, if it's sequence, then uh, you can actually treat the graph as a sequence in a certain way uh, by stacking subgraph together in a certain sequence. You still recover the original graph. And the good thing about the sequence, the sequential treatment, is that you can use reinforcement learning techniques. Right? It's kind of like a sexy technique this day. Anyone doing AI, I dream of, of applying reinforcement learning to their problems. Some work, some doesn't, but um, that's the reality of the day. Um, right, um, so another problem is that when to have some structure that you hope that become a drug, then you have to optimize it because it doesn't come easy. Right? Zenit model sometimes generates something really weird. Right? You have to optimize it for the purposes you want. So, the problem is called, um, it's called molecular optimization. And once again, you can think of as a machine translation, right? It's very interesting. Um, so here's an example. Um, you have a original graph. You can convert into something tree. Uh, for those who don't know something tree, is a super tree where each node is a subset of, of the nodes. And then you can actually using encoder and decoder uh, architecture for tree, not, not for sequence, okay? Um, this is known now. So. Don't think of inventing it again. Um, and then you can actually record it from the junction tree, you record back the graph. Right? So the trouble here is that the molecular space is very big, right? probably bigger than human languages. Um, so, um, so the modern, uh, one of the latest techniques, I think uh, ICR is here, is um, I find from MIT's. Um, they treat the molecular optimization as graph and graph translations, right? So um, people know, from machine translation, you know the sequence to sequence uh, mapping is translation problem, but now we have a graph to graph mapping as a also translation problem, right? And uh, they have quite interesting results. So I'm not going into detail of that, but um, the next thing here is that we can 
translate the problem into some other form that we know before and apply the uh, optical techniques or probably with some uh, cool, you know, change uh, to the Toga architectures, but the principle is the same. Right? And then, he, you know, same AI technique can be applied to both uh, NLP and, um, and draft design. Right, um, all right, so one of the uh, very busy uh, space is using uh, variational autoencoder for drug modeling. This is exciting just because, um, because the dream of AI is to, you know, to explore the entire space. Right? Anyone working in AI is they want to, to explore the entire space of something, right? but it's not possible. Um, not that easy. Um, so for those who don't know VAE, uh, here's very simple uh, uh, graphical architecture. I'm not going to detail that. Uh, but um, this is actually one of the uh, big moments that people prove that instead of dealing with drug directly, you actually can be dealing with uh, like a continuous space, small continuous space, something like a 10 dimensional. Whereas you know that the space of drug is very, very huge. Whereas 10 dimensional, it's quite easy to deal with this day with the modern optimizers, right? So one, what they do with that, what they did with that, they convert the drug into string smile using um, C INN encoder, put in the vectors, and then put it back, right? So, and then it can actually optimize on this little vector space so that it can move along the, the line of discovery, right? Um, and here's some example what they did. Um, the optimization was done through Bayesian optimization or another technique, but you can use any technique you like, right? Uh, the effect is almost the same. Um, the lesson here that even the drug space is discrete and very big, you can actually convert into small, much smaller continuous space and using the whatever technique you like, uh, because you know it, right? So, and it still works, very, very interesting. Um, another lesson so far with that, instead of dealing directly with drug, you can convert into tree, as I mentioned tree before, because tree is, much, tree is much easier to deal with, much nicer, you can use, um, because you have a wireform structure, then it can have um, forward, backward um, kind of uh, operations. Uh, very nice. Um, and um, the last one is that you can actually use reinforcement link um, for the graph. Uh, if you treat the graph as a sequence of smaller subgraphs, right? Um, so it looked like a uh, thing can be done, and here was actually the result from the NIPS, um, new, new, new RIPs last year. Um, uh, uh, obtaining the state of the art um, one year ago. The field is really going really quite fast, like com comparable to QA field. So every few months you have some state of the art, and probably a few weeks now you have state of the art. So this is already, already an old news, like one year old news. Um, but it's one of the significant um, ideas because uh, it's the demonstration that you can you actually you reinforce something on the graph domain, and it works quite well. Okay. Um, all right, so the last one, probably not really the last one, but uh, quite close. Um, the question is that you have the drugs, you have the molecules, but it's not yet the drug, right? How can you make it? Uh, you can make it in a computer, but it, how, how, how do you make it in the lab? Not easy, right? So, so here's an idea that they actually predict not the, not the drug itself, but the reactions. They predict the components so that it can react to make another molecule, bigger molecules, right? So. Um, there was a paper just, just on the archive, I think, a few weeks ago. Um, but luckily, is, um, there are many work on reaction prediction in this year. We can actually predict uh, if the two molecules interact and uh, react in a certain way. And, and here's one of the techniques that we did develop uh, and published um, uh, middle of the year. So it's called the uh, PD, uh, ZTPN. It stands for the Graph Transformation Coalition Networks. Um, so to predict that if the two molecules go together in, in given some reactant or catalyst, what are the product of reaction or if they interact at all, right? So the accuracy was good. So we can actually can plug this model into this framework and, um, and ask a question that if I do the drug design, then can I make it in the lab? So in, in, the, in the entire loop of the discovery itself. So for those who are really keen on um, playing this field, um, here is uh, one of the uh, most comprehensive um, uh, frameworks so that you can play with uh, most of the known models so far with the data set, with the data set that people collected and with the matrix that um, people cook up in the, in the field for the last few decades, right? Let's go Moses. And that's it uh, for me. Thanks very much.
Any question at all? Or are you too tired? That's fine. Oh, I think someone's uh, look after, uh, like run after me because the panel is coming up. Right? So I have to.